We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to come through to us is through the website. That way they don't get lost. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today is the last Wednesday of the month, and that means it's time for an AMA, or rather, Ask Us Anything. Uh, today, we're answering your questions live. I guess this is probably an even better way than sending them to us through the website. We're going to be taking questions from our chat room, also from Twitter. Uh, if you see us on social media and hit us up, we'll try to catch them there as well. I think Sean's also got Facebook. You're probably hearing this if you're on Facebook right now, but hey, fire away. All right, so up first, we have a question from Jeff Zeus. How many chances do you give a game that doesn't catch you on the first play? Well, depends how much it doesn't catch me on the first play. Um, there are some games that I, after one play, you can just tell are, are bad. Like, they're terrible. They're, they're not worth playing again. Um, back when we started Extra Life, we used to get donations from a lot of companies who had funded stuff through Kickstarter. I'm not going to mention specific names. Now, in general, when I buy a game, I've done enough research. I very rarely get a flop. And when people ask me to play games, it's not usually something I've never heard of before. So there's usually a pretty good chance I'm going to like the game. So it's not often I get something totally foreign to me in front of me. And like I said, the best example that I can remember is these extra light packages that were showing up from a couple specific companies. And it was a bunch of Kickstarter games. And some of them were so bad. Like they would have something that I could tell why they funded like some really neat art or a really unique theme, but like you just had to play it once and realize there's nothing more there. Uh, there's a couple older games. I want to call one so bad called Tcholka, which we call murder sorry, which was a version of sorry, except one of the players, uh, there was a way when you captured people, you threw them out to the woods to be eaten by the dead God. And if you were losing badly, you can decide to start worshiping the dead God. And then one points for killing everyone. So we called it mur murder sorry. Cause that was pretty much it. That is one of the worst games I've ever played. I'll admit I tried that one twice just in case we were missing something because it was that bad. Sometimes you just know. But then other games, uh, it's, I honestly think most, like if there's anything there, you should give it at least two shots, if not more. Now, when I'm doing reviews, I try to go for five before I get my final thoughts out there, just in case, because there's so many games that reward repeated play, where system mastery is a big part of the game. And actually, that's going to come up later when we get to the Tabletop Gaming Weekly segment. There were some games there that definitely weren't amazing on their first play. Well, and, and, another, which... and another aspect is uh, player count. Uh, we yes. talk about this a number of times, and we're going to talk about this again later tonight, uh, where some games really soar at certain player counts and fail miserably at others. Mm -hmm. uh, so you may have played it at the wrong player count. Now, unfortunately, one thing I'm seeing is we, we're talking about, you know, 8,000 plus games coming out a year. Mm -hmm. I would say that the majority of players aren't as forgiving. If, no, if they true. sit down and they have a, a, a really rough play with a game, they aren't going to go back to it. Um, again, it, a lot of it depends on who's, you know, if it's your game, if you've bought it, if, as Mo was saying, you've probably done that research in advance. But if you sit down at, a, at the FLGS and play somebody else's copy of a game and you really don't enjoy it, there's a good chance you're never going to go back to that game again and buying it's just right out the window. Yeah, very true. I say I, I, I like to give most games two tries, especially if I play the, I, you know what, to be honest, it's pure pressure in a way. It's, it's hype. If I play the game once and don't like it, but everyone I see on my Twitter feed or whatever is going on about how good it is, or when I post that I didn't like the game much, I get a bunch of people going, what do you mean you didn't like it? That game's awesome. Then I'll probably go around and actually give it a chance. Well, and, and be I, like, all right, I'll give it a second shot. And on that specific topic, Jeff had a follow-up. I want to love Scythe, but I tried it once and failed to find the fun. Same with Eclipse. And now Scythe is one of those games that people seem to love, but I know you're mm -hmm. the same way. You haven't really had the greatest love for it. No. But again, I, to be honest, this is one where I have literally played it once. The one experience I have with Scythe was not fun. I did not like the game. Now, I play enough games that I'm pretty sure I probably don't like Scythe. There's a chance it was the group I was playing with. But to be honest, it's the kind of game that should work with that group. 
It's not like we were trying to play a co-op game with uh, with the Trope Brothers, right? That <laughs> we were we were playing a head-to-head race to the points, big mecha on the fields resource game, right? It was the perfect game for the group I played with. But Scythe is one I honestly do want to play again. I want to sit down and give it another shot because everyone seems to love Scythe. But the one time I played it, no, I did not like it at at all. Like it was one of the the worst games I played with that group of players because usually when I play stuff with them. Uh, Neil is very good at selecting games that are the type I like, and I expected to like it. So we need to get um, we need to get you and Jeff sitting down at a table to play side. Yeah, and play side. There <laughs> we go with, with Mike Murphy. Mike Murphy just got the legendary edition, there and he's having trouble getting through the rule book. So Mike Murphy will come over. We'll invite <laughs> Jeff. We'll, we'll sit down. We'll play side, and I'll see. There we go. Everything I can tell about side is I liked Euphoria better, and that's the same designer with a similar race to points. And I I don't know. That's and good. that's without getting into the problematic content of Scythe that we talked about a couple weeks ago. <laughs> now, Eclipse, I love. So um, I know there's games out there. Here's an example of a game that I did not like the first play. So one of the best examples of that, it's Portal Games, Cry Havoc. I was trying to blank on the name. Cry Havoc, Steve, I don't know his last name. Someone who comes out to many. Actually, I haven't seen him in months. He used to come out to a lot of our local gaming events. Actually, I wonder what happened to Steve. I'm going to have to ask Sean Hamilton because he knows him. Not Sean from Hamilton. And Steve brought this game, Cry Havoc, and I played it. The thing is, I played it having already bought it. So there was a good deal online, or it wasn't a Kickstarter or whatever. I, I'm sure it was just a good price. And I bought the game. Then I went and I played Steve's copy, and I was like, oh, this is not great. I, I am not sure about this game. This is like, I like asymmetry. This game was so ridiculous asymmetric. I'm like, I don't even know what to think of this. It's a game all about colonizing a planet and exploiting it and doing terrible things to the indigenous species. And you play three different factions and each of the factions was completely different. Like they, they had completely different units. They had completely different actions. They had completely different buildings they could build, like completely different. And what's interesting is four players. One of the players actually plays the indigenous species with a whole different set of rules because they're playing the indigenous species. And it was this area control game. And I was just like, I don't know, it's like too much stuff trying to happen at once. And I couldn't get the different factions and I just couldn't see how to play it well. And I didn't understand how you could even enjoy this game because it was just too much different stuff happening. But then my copy showed up and I'm like, well, I bought it. I, 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 could, I guess I could just sell it sealed, but I'll give it a shot. And the second game, I played the same faction. And at that point, it was one of those Oh, wait a minute. Now that I've seen what the other factions do, I kind of get it. I'm like, oh, wait, the robots are supposed to be doing this and the humans are supposed to be doing this. And the, I don't remember what the other guys are. There was robots, humans and whatever the blue guys are. Um, and they're doing that. And I'm like, oh, now I'm starting to see the interactions. And I actually found the game so much better that I put it on my 10 by 10 list. It was one of the games I wanted to play 10 times because it really seemed like it was going to reward that re- repeated play. Now, interesting enough, that swapped around. By game six, I was sick of the game. I, I played it five more times after that, like six co- plays of my own copy. So I played Steve's copy, I played my copy, then I played my copy five more times, and after playing five more times, I found that it just wasn't fun, and one of the one of the races seemed ridiculously overpowered, which is actually what broke that for me. Which I guess there's an expansion that might fix it, but eh. Eclipse, though, I love, so I'm going to have to, I might have to get Jeff out to play Eclipse sometime, but I sold my copy waiting for the new Kickstarter, <laughs> which should have been here by now, and it's not. All right, so up next, from Major Kayla, we have, <clears throat> there are a lot of board games out there come linked to popular media, movies, or what have you. What are the best and worst, you know, media-driven games, or at least media-themed games you've played? The worst is Labyrinth. <laughs> Jim Henson's Labyrinth. Oh, my God. Like, I, I had heard that was bad. Here's a game that I knew was going to be a bad, but took a chance on because, oh, my God, I love Labyrinth. That game was terrible. There was not a redeeming quality in that game. I, I can't. The board ripped in half when I opened the box. Like, like it, it had die rolls for no reason and, and miss a turn and roll and move. And it, and then the worst part, you, you can go on the blog and read my review. The worst part is when I read the rule book, it almost sounded promising. Like your characters had different stats and stats were assigned dice. Like it almost sounded like Savage Worlds, but then they did nothing with it. Like it, oh, it was horrible. Best, Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, there are a lot of really good Star Wars games now, a lot. X-Wing is a fantastic miniature Starship battle game. Star Wars Imperial Assault is an awesome Rebels versus Imperial campaign game. Uh, Star Wars Rebellion, 
people keep calling Star Wars in the box, that I've only played once. So I really, as far as I can tell, everyone's like, it's amazing, but it takes like three to five hours to play. And it's two player best at two player. And it just, that doesn't happen. But when we played Chewbacca became a Jedi and that was pretty awesome. And like, we blew up Endor because, you know, there were Ewoks there, like, and you kind of tell the whole story. And what that game's about is one player is playing the Imperial trying to find the rebel base and the other players playing the rebels trying to hide the rebel base and they can blow up the death star. You can basically do all the stuff in the original trilogy. They can build the second death star. Actually, they can build the third death star in this one. Uh, like it's, and it is a great Star Wars game. Uh, Star Trek Ascendancy is a fantastic Star Trek game where the humans can literally win just by going everywhere and being nice and people shoot, switch, pop over to their side. And of course the Klingons win by being aggressive and taking people out. But like the Federation just shows up and it's like, we use diplomacy. Yeah. You join our side. Yeah. We use diplomacy. And then there's the Ferengi expansion, which I don't have yet, but it's all, there's no money in the game, but it adds money in the game. And if you have the most money, even if the other race have won, you win the game because you're the Ferengi and you're rich. And there's a, if you play with five players, someone, the Borg starts in the middle of the map. It, again, it's like they say, Star Wars, it's Star Trek in a box. Well, and we also obviously know what, uh, <coughs> what franchises Mo uh, prefers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to uh, jump around a little bit here. We had a question come in from the website. Corey Christensen asks, if you had to remove a game from your collection, which would it be? There you go. We're back to Labyrinth. That was easy. <laughs> Game was dad. No, actually, I can't yet because I have an expansion for it, and the expansion's technically in the pile of shame. And Deanna keeps telling me, you just gotta get rid of the game, get rid of it, go. And I'm like, oh, I gotta play the expansion first. So good luck finding people to play with. All right. I'm gonna jump back a second, though. Okay. What about you for for uh, movie-based games? I know you've done a few of them. Well, I know the worst, for, I, for the like worst I own is unquestionably the Harry Potter clue. Um okay. It was just horrible. I mean, that the mechanics in that were it was it was it had so much potential and it was just so badly done. I mean, we haven't put it back on the table. We played it. I think we tried it twice. Maybe the maybe we gave it the third try, uh, and then it went into a bench somewhere and <laughs> may never come out again. I no, um, not good. Uh, and then you know, again, for what I've done, I would have to say going way way back. One of my favorites is Vampire the Masquerade. Does Vampire the Masquerade count as a as a as a property? I don't know. Uh, the Vampire the Masquerade uh, card game, the original version. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. If there that was counts a TV as, series. Yeah. So, uh, but I guess there the TV, the TV series, series technically came from the the game. Well, yeah, from so, the role playing game. Um, uh, right now, I it's kind of obviously DC. Although I can't really stand DC's properties in general, their games <laughs> at least work. So, have you played the Marvel Legendary? I have not yet. No. Okay. I, so, I don't own it because I don't yeah. like it. <laughs> but no, I just, I, I, I just the when thing. I when I did the when I did the online comparison of how they played and things, it was my my son seemed to would uh, be likely more likely to enjoy despite his enjoy, his love of the Marvel properties, the DC gameplay better. So mm -hmm. that's why the way we went the way we did. Actually, we should we should spread that one out a bit. I know I'm, I'm I'm jumping over the other question about what you should throw out. What about RPGs? There's licensed RPGs. I'm trying to think. Worst licensed RPG I've seen. I know I played one. <laughs> and collectible card games, because man, the old Star Trek collectible card game was amazing. And then, well, there were also some really bad collectible card games. Yes, out there. Yeah, right. Mean, Sorry, RPGs. Worst Masters of the Universe. Yeah, well, you we yeah. should know that. Yeah, there we go. We've talked about that enough times. Although, except my, I, I I have this tendency to avoid that because it's not a game. Right? That's true. It's it's just it, it exists. <laughs> Plus, it's a board game. It, but it's called yeah. the role playing game. Like that's in there. But it's but it's, it's not a game title. at all. I, they mm -hmm. wanted it to be, but it just isn't. Yes. Oh. Uh, real RPGs. I don't know. Oh man. Star Wars: Edge of the Empire. Maybe. I can't say I've done too many Stargate branded RPGs. I, Babylon Five was bad. I'm trying to think of like my little pony seems impressive, but to be honest, I know it as a player, like my daughter ran it. Right. So I don't know how good the books actually are, but it seemed really good. Um, Elric, there's a good one, but I don't like the basic role playing system. Um, All right. Uh, other games I would get rid of. Um, uh, to be honest, there's not a lot. I don't, pur I, I'm going to purge for extra life. I do every year. I'm purging just to make room. Um, I'm trying to find the exact question again. 
if I had to remove a game from my collection, there's quite a few, actually. To be honest, there's probably about 20 games I could easily get rid of at this point. Mostly stuff I just don't play anymore. Um, there's a thing out there. It's called Jones Theory. And I don't know the guy's last name, but it was something, or first name, something Jones. And he posited that new board games come out, they make previous games obsolete. And there's no need to play that previous game anymore now that this new game's there. So they talk about how different games Jones Theory out other games. So uh, an example is Isle of Sky is a tile lane game where you're matching things, getting points. Jones Theory is Carcassonne for some people. I don't personally, it's close. I still play Carcassonne, so it hasn't Jones theory it for me. So there's games like that, right? Where I don't feel the need to play this anymore because I have a better version. So for me, Splendor. The only reason we're keeping it is Deanna likes it and it's good for gateway games, but I see no reason to play Splendor when I can play Gizmos or I can play other of those small, simple engine builders. So interestingly, so Jones theory, and I, I couldn't quickly find his name, uh, again, is... Uh, the main idea is that a game collection should contain no more than one game of the same type. But following on from that, you get the Richard's postulate, which is if a game has not hit your table in a year, it shouldn't be in yeah. your collection. See that I'd, I'd have much less games if that yeah. was the case for me. I could, I could probably go games that have been at least five years and I might be at the point. There's probably some games down there. I haven't played in 10 years. And then, um, well, there's also Norwood's theory, which is keep the games you like. <laughs> Yeah, yep. Yeah. That, that, that's the opposite, right? Yeah. Like part of it is is I'm a collector, right? For a while, but I'm, I've gotten over that a lot. I now throw out boxes, I recycle boxes, I don't keep the stuff for the expansions. But there's just like I can look around and go, you know what? I haven't played that in forever, and I have no desire. It's to be honest, it's the Mary Kondo thing. Really, it is. It's it's does it spark joy? I look and I'm like, do I go? Oh, I want to play that again, or am I like? Eh. And there's more and more in my collection that I look and I'm like, eh. Like, I picked up Bicycle, right? Here's an example. Bicycle is a version of Pitch Car, but it has this thing called the Z-Ball. And inside this little ball, little marbles. So you can actually do stuff like put English on it and stuff, and it's really neat. But it requires way more skill, and it's really difficult for new players to play, and it's Pitch Car. And you only have the one ball, so you have to, like, put it behind your bike and move your bike and flip. And I'm like, pitch car is just so much more elegant and simple, and it's wood instead of a plastic track. I'm like, I, I like the concept of being able to play a skill-based pitch car. Like, not that there's no skill required in pitch car, but like to be able to do like English and backspin sounded really cool. But like, I am break that out, pitch car. It's just never going to happen. Like, if I'm running a gaming event, it's not like there's a bunch of pitch car experts here in Windsor. We're like, let's bring it to the next level. Like, it's just not going to happen. Yep. All right. We're probably spending too much time on each topic here. So next up, we have another question from the website. Ralph asks, what is the best gateway area control game? Ooh, I'm going to go way back. Here's a game that, that I probably have Jones Theory to out of my collection, but Clans, uh, I'm trying to think of even who makes it. It's like either Rio Grande or Mayfair. A new version of that's coming out. That is a really simple one So uh, where you're just putting out huts. Zedman Games and Venice Connection are two of the publishers anyway. Okay. I had it before that, so it must be Z-Man now. 2002 uh, release. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's older. Uh, Re-implemented by Faye, F-A-E. Faye, that's it. That's the new one, F-A-E, which is probably just as good. But really simple game where you're just moving your huts and your, gather your huts represent barbarian tribes or, or tribes of people, different clans, and you're grouping onto different colors, and each round different colors are going to score. So you're trying to group your people in different spots. I think that one's a great gateway area control. Um, trying to think of other area control. Uh, yeah, I almost want to say King Domino, but that's not area control. But it's it's got the concepts of building your area and getting points, but it's not the control part because you're never playing against another player. But like to get that whole trying to build areas and score points for areas, El Grande is still the best area control game ever made, in my opinion. Actually, he's saying area control. Technically, it's area majority. Um, trying to think of others. Kemet, but that's not that. Good a gateway game. Why well, I'm trying to think, what else do we have for area control games without Googling? See, I'm to <laughs> Google it. Google it. Are we trying to get real answers? Am I using the internet like I would if I was writing an article, or do I even <laughs> not use the internet? Uh, I'm not sure where we are going. Well, for I think it. we got. I just, think we've, yeah, I we've got an answer there. We've definitely, we've definitely given an answer. I feel like I'm 
getting something good. That's that's <laughs> what's trying. Like Tyrants of Underwork, I kind of want to say. Well, we can come back to um, it. If, uh... I think Small World, Small World is probably actually you know what Small World takes over. Small World is folk on a map counters and the combat system is so simple it's you count your counters you count their counters you knock off one counter from each side until one side has more and that's who wins and that's it and like it's that simple to the fact that if there's terrain that's just another counter and it counts for the defender so if there are mountains in the area there'll be a little mountain chit and you have two of your troops defending the mountain while well, you have three counters i have four counters i take your territory it is that dead simple um really neat asymmetric game where you have different races that are matched with types so you could have like flying barbarians and aquatic elves and all this stuff and as you expand out you'll run out of troops and then you have to go into decline it's called so you spend one turn where you flip all your people over and then next turn you come back into the game with a new race and it's all you score points for every area you control at the end of every round and i think you play 10 rounds there you go i I, it's small world for sure all right there we go uh going come back to a jeff uh question from the uh chat lobby uh, what games do you love, but find it impossible to pitch successfully to a group of players? Town Center is the one, the hardest. Town Center is this game where you're trying to represent building a city center using cubes, and the cubes grow. Like, it's hard to describe, see? Because <laughs> the cubes grow organically based on the rules, based on what's next to them. So if a shop has power and there's enough people in the city, it'll grow. And it can only grow if you have enough elevators. And the game is fascinating to me. It's something that Heavy Cardboard, Edward from Heavy Cardboard, got my head on to, like, pointed me at. Because it's, you have to think spatially, which not a lot of games do that. And it's a heavy filler, thinky filler, where you have to think spatially. And it's all about drafting cubes, and then each cube represents different types of buildings, and trying to manage your power levels and set it up. Your city grows on its own. But you don't want to out because you spread to the suburbs those points. And like trying to sell that on someone and then bringing it out and showing it to people and they, they're expecting, you know, the climbers or something simple. And it's so not. So yeah, that's a that's a big one. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see a game that's a 30 minute playtime, but a 3.24 weight. Yeah. <laughs> that's it's, that's it's not something you see. Like that's yeah. that's pretty rare. I love that game, but I can't get people to play. Like, I really can't. Um, plus, all the all the big ones, right? Like, trying to convince anyone to play Twilight Imperium. I didn't buy it, Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. Because I know, like, maybe once a year, I'll get people to play it. And the nights I can play it are, like, New Year's, where I don't actually want to be tied up for eight hours because I want to play a bunch of different things with a bunch of different people. And I just, we don't have, we have kids now, right? Like, we don't have the come over Saturday at six and we'll play till three in the morning just doesn't happen as often as it used to when we were younger. Yep. I, even if the kids are gone, we are just older and can't necessarily get away with that. Or I can, but Deanna can't because she taps out way earlier than I do. <laughs> uh, so that's another one, anything that's big like that. Um, and well, it seems like any more role-playing games of any sort, I can't seem to bitch to anyone. I'm like, come on guys, we're going to play dungeon crawl class. We're going to do this. Hey, we're going to play mouse guard. I don't know. Well, I mean, I, the, I need a brand new group or we got to start playing online. Well, I think the big problem with role playing games is, I mean, just adult time management, right? An RPG takes a lot of time to do properly for, mo- for the most part. You can't, you know, you can't get away with, uh, you know, oh, three hours this week. And then a month later, another three hours. It just doesn't work as well. You and that's that's pretty much where we're at with the, the group. Like, yeah, I get people on Mondays now, so that's which is a nice change from a few months ago. People have been coming out every Monday for the last few weeks, but it's not the same people every week, which is the problem. Like it's the yes, we could play one shots every week, but I, the hard part is even playing with a one shot. I never know until like an hour before exactly how many players I'm going to have. Right. Which is fine. Like I, I realize that the people I am currently playing with have certain sets of obligations and, and limitations that mean they can't let me know ahead of time, which is fair. Yeah. It's just, yeah, any, I, I can't, get, I, I could pitch every RPG. Uh, the, I bet, though I still swear, if I said we're going to restart our Warhammer 3rd edition campaign, or if I said we're going to start playing D&D, I'd have people. <laughs> so I, I swear that's there. Uh, so here we go. From, on, from Twitter. At Binks Games asks, what is your snack of choice and is it the same as your game group? All right. Uh, we had this as a blog topic, basically. It's come up a couple times for food and drink. And I went on about this. I don't tend to snack while playing. I, I 
that's to me the food part is separate from the gaming part. I know back when we were kids, yeah, there was the whole Cheetos, Doritos, bag of whatever, and Jolt Cola and Spider Butter Bars and whatever. But anymore, um, we tend to avoid the snacks almost totally. We eat before playing. Or even if I'm playing in a public place, I will take a break to eat. So, like, if we're at the CD Realm and we get Coney Dogs, I'll have them deliver Coney Dogs to another table. I'll wait till the game's done. Then I'll go eat my Coney Dogs. And then I will start another game. Like, it's, it, I tend to separate them. Now at home, now and then we'll grab snacks. We are big on small finger foods being... Um, not finger foods, but like small snacks, chocolate covered espresso beans, espresso beans, or chocolate covered coffee beans. Generally, anything that's not sticky, powdery, or like gummy. Not gummy's not bad as long as it doesn't get wet. Um, um, I there's these cluster cashew clusters you can get from Costco. I'm a big fan of those right now, and I eat an awful lot of raw almonds now, unsalted raw almonds, which again is all stuff that you don't really get can't get on the cards, can't get onto the stuff. But even that, like, it's, like, once every five games, I'm sitting there and I'm starving for some reason, so I go and grab something. As for other people, the people we play with now don't tend to... No, I can't... No one seems to bring anything. Back when we used to do 4th edition D&D, we used to give... Well, not XP. We had a whole fun point system where we gave points for people bringing snacks. And that tended to be packages of things, like a pack of Oreos or a McCain cake <laughs> that seemed to be popular. But again, we tended to like eat that, then play. Right. Personally, I'm I'm a salty snack guy. Uh, you give me um, flavored pretzels. I don't like plain pretzels, but give me the flavored pretzels or potato chips, and I'm good. But that's a role playing thing for me. Uh, board yeah. games, I've never felt the need to really snack. Um, it just it's never a thing. But yeah, if I sit down at a, at a at an RPG, I generally expect to have a bag of something near me. Just you know, it's part of it's. And it, again, a lot of it's just habit from playing years mm-hmm. and years ago where we would always have that, you know, crap food around yep. us. Crap food. Yes, definitely. Crap <laughs> um, food. You know, seven, whatever we got from the 7-Eleven or the, uh, yep. you know, the local university uh, store. Even then, like, break for dinner. Like, we didn't sit and eat hot dogs or pizza no, while no, we were it playing. No, no, it was snack food and, and, snack and soda, you know, yeah. generally. Um, I, I wonder if that's part of it, too. Like I said, we used to do it with 4th Edition. So I don't think when we played, we played Warhammer, I don't think we did a lot of snacking. It could just be that mainly we're doing board gaming. And in general, I said with board gaming, we don't. Part of it, too, with RPGs, you know what? I, I'm just, it just clicked into my head at the time. With RPGs, you tend to only touch your own stuff. You yeah. have your dice, your pencil, your character sheet. And if you get Cheetos crap all over it, no one cares because it's all your stuff. Yep. And I wonder that's if that's true. an aspect to it. Because, like, it's not, a, and like, except for maybe passing around the rule book. No, that's very true. I, I never I never considered that. But yeah, uh, RPGs do tend to be a very personal yeah. space game oh. interesting uh now we have uh nursey poo left a question <laughs> on one of our gloomhaven actual play videos they said just played my first gloomhaven scenario today well congratulations nursey poo any advice for a beginner tips or things that i can get the most out of the game thanks well there's two guys on twitter that did an faq review i hear that's invaluable i suggest checking that out if you google FAQ or youtube gloomhaven faq you should be able to find it it's by two guys mo and sean I, as far as i can tell it's fantastic advice people seem to love it it's got like over three thousand hits now um <laughs> uh advice for a beginner in gloomhaven um don't play four player if you can avoid it seems to be a thing do not feel shamed for playing on easy i think that's my biggest tip the game is not easy. There are 45 pages of rules and lots of little details and idiosyncrasies and things to learn. We have played over 30 games and still mess up rules, as comments on our last video show. <laughs> we screwed up two things in our last game. Thanks, Temujin. Um, don't, don't, just, just, if you get beat, don't get frustrated. Just try again at an easier difficulty. Uh, other than that, cards are your life. Like, realize that if you run out of cards you you lose like do not use those burn cards the ones where you have to put them in your lost pile yep. if almost if at all possible like save them until you absolutely need them um use the gloomhaven helper app because my god it makes the table a lot clearer and it keeps track of everything well not everything you have to do it all but it's all tracked there and you don't have all the counters everywhere and you don't knock stuff over and it's it's just much cleaner experience um I'm trying to think of what else. 
That's probably, that's probably the main ones. Yeah, I would say, you know what? I, and now this, this goes completely contrary to what you guys do on Friday nights. But <laughs> I would say, lay out the whole map. When you get to a scenario, that's actually by the rules. If you're, you know, let don't don't follow what we do on Friday nights. <laughs> actually, put out that whole map, read through, and and really importantly, read through yes. the whole scenario because yes. we've gotten burned a few times that on that where they put something in a strange place, and you think you don't want to read that because you don't want to give something away. Well, you know what? Risk giving something away. Just get it all, get the map down, read through the whole scenario, and figure it out. No, oh, that's good. We should, I think we should switch to doing that. Yeah. It's I'm it more interesting and dramatic, and it's just my role playing DM nature <laughs> that I'm like, no, I want to keep it on my chest and make it more interesting. And Tori and Kat find it more interesting. Right? Uh, absolutely. So, and, and I mean, to be fair, now, I mean, that's the reason I got the rule book so that I can actually okay. check ahead and double check for you. Um, all right. Well, yeah, don't, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Yeah. Um, realize you don't have to use the same party. Characters can come in and out. Try random dungeons. That's a good way to level up. Uh, lots of little things. And actually, and uh, Dee's pointing out in the chat room that uh, she burned out cards that she wouldn't have if she'd known the layout. Uh, now, yeah. interestingly, one thing that happens in the uh, digital version, the Steam version of Gloom, uh, at least on the with current what's currently available they do not have scenarios available yet mm -hmm. on that but it is a hidden map and yep. what's really annoying and has kill and has actually killed me on some scenarios i've tried is the doors aren't obvious yeah that's so i've gone the wrong way into a room not knowing that i walked past a door and i couldn't get back before losing you know i you know there was just nothing i could do um, now, to be honest, Isaac has explained that he wants it all to be hidden. Right. It just there was no way to present it that way. Right. Like there's no way to present the scenario without the book being three times bigger, having to do a separate page for every room. Mm. There was no way to present it in the book. Is it's meant to be that you don't know what's in the next room. So I wonder if it, I wonder if the campaign in the eventual release of the uh, game we'll will actually hidden. have it hidden. Then, if that's if that's his wishes, interesting. As I said, the 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 playing it properly is the information's meant to be hidden. You're not meant to be able to count how many monsters are going to be in the last room so that you spawn enough so that they're not there and stuff like that. Right. Which you can do. You can metagame if you're looking at it. Or knowing that, hey, there's traps in the last room, so I don't want to use my trap thing in the first room and there's only two traps because there's 20 in the next room. Right. You're, the players aren't meant to know that. Right. Which is kind of why we are doing it the way where I know it and I try not to talk about it. All right, moving on. We have a question from Ryan. Have you ever removed an expansion from a game, and why? I swear I have. There are, oh, there. Um, Lanterns, the Harvest Festival. Fantastic game. Love the fact that in that game, what you are doing affects all the players. And you play a tile, and you're going to get something for it, and so is everyone else. So the entire game is about trying to do the best for you without doing better for another player, which I think is really neat. And it's a fun, quick filler game, rather nice looking. I wouldn't call it beautiful, but it's neat looking with all the flowers and the boats. It's cool. It's got some nice wooden components. The expansion for that just muddied the game. There was just too many more things to think about. I'd added new components that weren't wood, which just was lame versus the original. Like you have these nice wooden fate tokens and it added these new tokens that are cardboard. Um, new ways to make combos and then new ways to score and end goals. And it just, it wasn't fun. It was more fun to play the base game. It, I'm sure some gamers found it better. So that's what it felt like is they tried to add complexity to up the weight level for people who like heavier games. And I don't think it was warranted at all. I prefer the base lanterns game to the expansion. Um, I haven't technically removed it, but I can't remember the last time I played with it. Now, more recently, many times in the last two weeks, I have removed and put back the Escalation expansion from uh, Eminent Domain. So I will often, and this is true of almost every game I own, pull out expansions for teaching the game to new players for the first time, which I do a, a lot with the events I run in the city. So I pull the expansion cards out. Terraforming Mars, there's another example we'll get to in a second. So Eminent Domain, we're going to get to it in the week in review. I taught, oh, we played many times in this past week. Also, my friend Tom's over. We're playing. He hasn't played in three or four years. He had played it before. I'm like, whoa, we're going to pull that out. 
And then, then Tori and Kat come over, and I'm like, yeah, it's already out. Let's play again. Now let's put it back in. If I was going to teach Sean how to play in a mid-domain, I'd pull it out again, right? So I've often done it for that reason. But even more so, like I said, the ones, Terraforming Mars, we've talked many times. Deanna hates Venus Next. I personally don't mind it. But I have pulled it out as well as other expansions just to speed up the gameplay. So often, especially at a public event, um, I did this two, three Two months ago, maybe it was a month ago, at easy mode, group of players, never played Terraforming Mars, showed up, I broke it out, I kept in Preludes because it speeds up the game. But then I also used the expansion rules where everyone's, the basic rules where everyone starts with one resource because it also speeds up the game, but I pulled out everything else. I pulled out the new cards from Preludes, I pulled out the new, all of the Venus stuff, and I, I pulled out all my promo cards. Because they'd never played before, and I didn't want them to experience it, but I did use some expansions. And I often, like, Venus is literally its own baggie in Terraforming Mars. And when people stop playing, I ask that they please sort through the cards and take them out so that it's ready to play next time. Because I don't keep it in there. So th those are some good examples. So I have done it. It's not often, in most cases, 90, almost 80, 80 to 90% of the time, expansions tend to improve. I've found, I'm, I'm usually a thumbs up to most expansions, but then, now and then... Okay. Not the case. Now, as a follow-up from D, what is your favorite board game expansion that you feel is a must-have? Galactic Orders for Core Worlds. I honestly think, I, I'm pissed at Stronghold Games for this one. It should have been in the box. Because you read the rule book, and it points out, what are these symbols on this card? Well, they're for a future expansion, which means you had that expansion written. Why didn't you just include it in the box? Like, it was purely for monetary reasons. I found that frustrating. I, I'm sure, like, Stephen Bonacore is pretty good, right? Like, Stronghold Games, the man behind it, knows his stuff. He probably did all the research and probably did the right thing. But it frustrated me to have what felt like an incomplete game. And then to get the expansion and be right, like, it really did feel like it completed the game. And it, then it just more so is like, like, I'm happy. I, it's still literally my favorite deck builder. So it's not like I'm trying to bash the game, but I found it really frustrating that the game feels without it. So I will never, ever play that game without it. Um, I can't see playing Terraforming Mars though Prelude now, but I don't think it completes it. I don't think it's a, it's, it's, it's close to a must have. I really think the game's better with it. Um, there's others. I know there are. But yeah, Core Worlds is the first one that comes to mind. Core Worlds with Galactic Orders. You can't play without Galactic Orders. And they put an expansion after that. I don't even remember the name of the uh, something throne. Yeah, that one, eh, take it or leave it. Adds for heroes. Again, I'm not Googling, so I can't <laughs> look up the name of the... I have it. It's in my game. The last two times we played, we played once with it, once without. But Galactic Orders, definitely. All right, so uh, another one from uh, Ryan here. Uh, to get a longer game played, are you willing to break it into multiple sessions? And what games have you done this with? And this is excluding RPGs, which it's kind of a given you're going to break up. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's generally given. Uh, yes, it, uh, we've done it not often. Um, part of the problem is I do a lot of different stuff in my basement. I have a large table. I can leave games set up, especially now that we live stream Gloomhaven on Fridays. That's less likely to happen. Before that happens, sometimes we play a game on Monday night, leave it up, set up till the next week. More often, though, Deanna and I will be playing something and we'll leave it set up. An example of that was Twilight Struggle, which is was the number one rated two player game on Board Game Geek. Still might be, to be honest. Um, we definitely that took us two games, two days to get through. Um, it, we do it now and then. I, I'm willing to do it, but there aren't a lot of games that are that epic that need it to happen. Um, I think there's one we did recently. What's more often is we'll fail a mission in Gloomhaven and just leave it set up to try again the next week. We did that before. We I, and except we don't get the play when that happens and people cancel. Right. I mean, at this guy, at this point, uh, you know, we'll we'll uh, we'll conclude Gloomhaven with the RPGs because, again, it's yeah, it's you're going to have to have to break that up over multiple sessions. Um, See, with that one though, it's it's the leaving the tiles and everything set up, which isn't something you normally have with D and D. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we we have, but we don't often play. Wait, we did it with a uh, colony, Co the colonist colonies, the epic game. I think it's called Colonies. Uh, the, the ridiculous game with four different eras of play, and we played with Sean Hamilton. We left it up for three weeks. So yeah, we'll definitely do it, because that's like a, a four-hour session per era, 12-hour total. 
The Colonists? The Colonists. That's the name, The Colonists. Right. And uh, Through the Ages was mentioned in there, too. That's another one where, yeah, if you, I, 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 can, I can imagine leaving that set up. I could imagine it, but again, usually, like, I kind of said it earlier. When we have those big epic game nights, we plan big epic game nights, right? So we've done this recently. We did Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, and I did Zaya with Chad and Justin, two local gamers, where we set up a night to play. And we're like, you guys are going to come over, come over for five, make sure you've eaten first. At nine or ten, we're going to order some food in, and we're going to take a two-hour hour break, 45-minute break to eat, and then we'll finish the game. Which didn't end up being necessary for Twilight Imperium, surprisingly, because like that game was over in under three hours. I was really surprised by that because everyone talks about how Twilight Imperium Four is just as bad as two for length, and it definitely wasn't. That's a game I'd like to play again, but again, I don't doubt I'm going to buy it. Um, so uh, moving on here, we have uh, ah, here we go. Now I think we've talked about this before, but it's worth touching on again. Uh, Joe Lemire left this question on the Bellhop blog. What was the first game you remember playing that got you into the hobby? All right, I talked about this one with Deanna before the show because this one's really hard to answer. It's like asking someone, Sean, when's the first time you ate carrots? Because, <laughs> like, I grew up with board games, right? So I was thinking about this. I'm like, all right, let me think hobby board games. I'm like, all right, hobby board games. I bought White Dwarf Issue 100 from, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the stupid Leisure World at Devonshire Mall. I was 12, and that got me into Warhammer and Games Workshop, and I bought Talisman, and maybe that's my first one. But before that, my dad owned Awful Green Things from Outer Space and owned Snit's Revenge, and I remember playing Awful Green Things from Outer Space with my grandmother. Or before that, my dad had Dark Tower, and I played Dark Tower with him. So really, I played like that game then, right? Like I was playing those in, what, I was seven? When Dark Tower, I was six or seven when Dark Tower came out. Like, just we've all, my dad was a gamer and like I have role playing games. I got into TSR Marvel Super Heroes in 1985. Uh, but before that, my cousin and I, he had the DD action figures and he had a Commodore 64 and he had a game for it called Oubliette. And he had the rule book for Oubliette. And in the back of the rule book for Oubliette was all the rules for the map that was in the game. So we used to play with the D&D figures, but use the RPG rules. We didn't call them that, but there was really the role-playing rules for combat from Oubliette. And like, I don't know, how old were we then? I don't even know. Like, I, I was young. I honestly, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> like, I have no idea what, what the first game I remember that got me into. I was always in the hobby, I guess. Uh, yeah, I have to say, like, it's interesting because, I mean, the first hobby board game I played, I would have been crazy late in it. Uh, but... You know, I grew up playing so many board games. I mean, we had shelves and shelves and shelves of board games, which were, for the most part, mass market. But even some of those were a little more off the, you know, off the main shelf mass market. They were, I mean, uh, we weren't, my, my, my family wasn't role playing or anything, but they were getting some, some interesting games off of, you know, from mm -hmm. some of the, some of the more specialty game stores and not yep. just, you know, going to Toys R Us and, and picking up games there. And, and I've got some great fond memories of uh sitting down and, and playing games with the family uh you know some of that 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 pipe uh pipe playing game that Water uh, waterworks you know is yep. it a, yep. it's it's a, that's really a hobby game if you you know if you it's uh, Parker it, brothers so, but it's part but, it's yeah. burger brothers it but i mean the 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 mechanics and things like that is a little yep. more on the hobby game side my dad had peak oil i think it was called where you'd move the little oil things to see if you struck oil right. like like it was just always a thing, yep. like I, which I'm sure for some kids nowadays, it's the same thing. But like everyone always gives me a dirty look when I answer that way. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, I just grew up with this stuff and never really stopped. Uh, so next up we have. All right. So we all know your thoughts on the Master of the Universe role playing <laughs> game from FASA. If you were going to actually make a He-Man RPG. Uh, oh, let's say let's include she in that. So we, you know, yep. all of all of the uh, the universe. What system would it be powered by? Uh, they already exist. It's called um, Cartoon Action Hour. So I don't know that that's supposedly the system to be used. Um, I don't know. D and D would probably work. Out of the systems I own, I don't know. I can't think of anything great that I would use. Like, what's iconic about? He-Man that's not just generic fantasy. He had laser guns. 
Like, what makes a He-Man? I can't think of anything that, that any generic fantasy system wouldn't cover. For like, I, Everyone had their unique thing. So, okay, so maybe we're looking at, I think it's 13th Age. I think 13th Age is the system where every character has a unique thing. So you could be, say, the last of the dwarves. And this thing is always universally true for you, that, that this, this is a true thing. I, I could see that because you had, you know, Ram Man and Fisto and, like, they all had arms and they all had a specialty, even if it was just, like, a giant flipping gun and fist to punch people with, or I can headbutt people. But, like, they have to have that. So you have to have a shtick. You have to have that. Fate would work for that reason because that would be your, your high concept, right, your main aspect. Um, you know what would probably work is a hack of Iron Edda Accelerated. You'd start off with, like, instead of your holdfast creation, it'd be, like, your Greyhawk, like, whatever, I don't Eternia creation, like, your your city. You'd make your city, but then you'd have to find something to replace, like, the, you wouldn't have the Bone Giants, obviously, but, like, the rest of the, you'd have to have a different set of rules. But some of the aspects they had in there, especially with the scale, where you have the, the human scale and then the godlike scale, so you'd have your one thing that would be at the step up, right? Yeah, like, yeah. so, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need... Thing. You wouldn't need size as a scale. It would be power level as a no, scale. No, no, power level. Yeah. Power level. So right? you, you like, wouldn't like, need like, you wouldn't need your bone giants and your 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 dwarven uh, mechs. Your dwarven um, destroyer. Because no. it would be it would just be, would be you know scale the person you know the the sword is that you know scale it is that you know you've yeah. got if whoever has both halves of the halves of the sword put together yeah, gets, gets the, the ultimate epic, power. Yeah. You know that's or what it, I don't know if God lights before epic. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, something like that would, would definitely work. You just throw out the size aspect because size isn't important. It's all about pure power level. Yeah. I think uh, Fate Accelerated might work or some hack of Fate Accelerated. I can't see it being empowered by the apocalypse. Like, I just don't see it being that narrative a game with the fail forward. Just doesn't seem like a human thing to me. And uh, Swords Without Master might work where you get to be a badass and be challenged. Uh, how well would uh, um, Game Park? Um, eh, it works for everything, but it's a little too generic, too, I think. Yeah, okay. Like, there's nothing about, like, you could do anything with it. Right. It's like saying, yeah, we could do it in curbs, because you could, <laughs> of course. Of course you could. Um, all right, so another question from the website. What are your thoughts on other game experience enhancing products? Sound music for the years, we've talked about a bit, but uh, candles for scent, game-related snacks. This is from Owlbear. You know, I love the concept of it for role-playing games. That's why I bought the Hue Lights, right? Like, that, that is literally why I did it. It's why I dig Sirens games. It's why I put on tabletop audio every time we play Gloomhaven now. And I just put on that background cistern sound of the dripping water and the weird sound effects. Where I put on one the other day that was called like Mechanical Chains because we were in that one lab. And I try to find a different soundscape every time we play. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Though I got to admit, there's a metagame aspect that definitely brings you out. Right, like it's awesome to have the dramatic. The orc's about to cast a spell, and everything turns green. But it's not so dramatic when I'm like, "Wait a minute, okay," and everything turns green. Right, like there's that pause. And for those of you listening at home, I just grabbed my phone and pretended <laughs> I was playing with it. Forgot the fact that there are people just listening. Um, the candles I so want to review because, in the sense, like there are these things where you can get these little, like they look like little gels, and they're sensey or whatever, and you're supposed to pass it around. I love the concept of, but I just worry they're going to like work one session and be gone. Like the scent won't be strong enough, but I love the concept of having like the stable scent and like opening it under the table and just seeing people notice, or you're having the campfire. I like the idea, but man, every company that sells them, they're ridiculously expensive. And like I said, I, it, I don't want them for, a, I don't want it to be a one stick gag. Right. Like I want to be able to get this thing and be able to open it up and use it over 20 sessions. And part of the problem is well, I don't role play regularly enough. If I'm only going to play every six months, I'm sure my scents aren't going to last that long. Yeah, and one of the problems, like like Sensi is a great product uh, for you know making the the uh, the place your your house smell a little nicer, but yeah. it's not something you can really swap. So you can't you know if you're changing areas, you can't quickly change the scent in a room. Yeah, you've 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 scented the room. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can see it being great as a sort of a general ambiance for. Yeah. the entire session but uh you know again i mean yeah i suppose you could do the pass around a bottle and sniff from and, and you know well, there's, from yeah, the bottle. There's, the, there's one company they're little like things that are i don't know about an inch in diameter and you're supposed to pass them around but it just 
hey, here's what the dungeon smells like is a little weird. Yeah, that, but like I could see for the right, like especially if it was important to the story, like you open the door and you smell this, right. I could see. But then you need a specific scent, like, and it should be, probably be a clue to some kind of mystery or something, right? Like the, it should be a re- repeating scent or something. Yeah, I, I, I have a hard time with uh, here, smell this now. Uh, again, unless it is a, a vital hint sort of thing, Right. Um, I could I could definitely see if you were doing a detective style uh, yeah, something and, you right? know, hey, and you find a clue, here's scent, your right? clue. Uh, and, you know, and, and he keeps coming up. But, uh, you know, otherwise, again, a sensi ambience type thing, I can definitely see. A, I mean, you want to be careful because you don't want, uh, you know, 16th century English sewer. Uh, you know, that's, that's not something anybody wants to smell. Even if that's, even if that's the accurate scent for the, for the game, you don't want that. Um, but, uh, yeah, you can definitely, you know, even if it's just something like, you know, very subtle, uh, I can definitely see a benefit for that just to keep, you know, again, add to that mood, add to the ambiance, you, the low, the lights are, the lights change a little bit. The scent comes on. You've got a little bit of background music. And again, it's not, you know, the dramatic action music. It's just that ambiance where you you feel a little more in a place. And then gaming related stacks, I always like the concept of. I the, the closest I ever did to it. Uh I'm gonna get in trouble for for stereotyping here. Is uh, I took fortune cookies when we played Feng Shui, and every time someone used a stunt, they pulled a fortune cookie and I put modifiers in it so you crack the potion cookie and get something cool right but i like the idea like i know people who have done like they've done you can get cookbooks for all the things right so you can get like harry potter if you're running a harry potter rpg having butterbeer stuff like yep. that i love yep. the concept but i've never done it and it's and we, i mean we've talked about theme nights and so you know you, you yep. can do that whole theme night uh game idea uh they're just talking about uh, the 1890s Thames uh, scent. Uh, my <laughs> yeah. first thought when they said that was uh, when we were playing Birmingham, you can have the scent of yes, brass. Birmingham well, has a burning coal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Play brass. There is nothing that would be pleasant about that scent. Um, that, that would be easy, uh, eagerly avoided. Uh, now, I think we're going to uh, probably strap up on this question. Skeeter asks, any recommendations for cooperative games for kids for family games nights? Now we've covered this in general, but uh, have you got any further or, or new thoughts on cooperative uh, games for kids for family game nights? That uh, still ghost fighting treasure hunters. I still have not played anything better than that game. I still haven't tried the expansion. I, I have no gaming budget anymore. <laughs> uh, it's been available. It's out there. I haven't seen it cheap. I do really want to try the expansion but just the base game is fantastic um my kids still love outboxed personally i don't think that's great for families because it's if you're an adult you can do logic well enough that it shouldn't be a problem for you to be able to solve it a little easy but if my kids still love it um trying to think of co-op games that i play with my kids not a lot of co-op games um flashpoint fire rescue um i still actually have that with my kids and I had a chance to sit down and play it with them. I still think would be good. I can't think of anything new that's co-op that I played. Unless I'm drawing a complete blank here. I'm like Go Cuckoo and King of the Dice. All the newer kids, all the kids games I played with my kids recently have not been. Oh, wait, wait, Stuff Fables. There we go. There, there's a recommendation that I don't think existed back when we did episode two. Uh, Stuff Fables is a game where you are playing the Stuffed animals protecting a girl from the monsters under her bed for her first night going to bed in a big girl bed. Uh, Epic story game. Very well done. Which way elements. Looks like it's going to be a miniature combat game like Mice and Mystics. See, Mice and Mystics was an old recommendation. Scratch that one. Throw Mice and Mystics out. Save that for when the kids are teens or at least a little older, young teens. And play Stuff Fables, much more accessible to kids. And it's not all combat. It's like the second part of the book is like you're bouncing down a hill of toys in a Red Rider cart and do you fall out type of thing. It's it's like skill challenges from 4th Ed D&D. With color-coded dice, even my youngest could get it. So there, yes, I do have a new recommendation. And I want to scratch one off the list because I actually think... Um, Mice and Mystics is too complicated for kids. I push that on my kids too early. Uh, they may be old. I'm sure the oldest is old enough now, but the youngest probably would not still have difficulty with Mice and Mystics. 
Uh, oh, that's right. Talisman one. That's right. Um, Tiana mentioned that in the chat. Talisman Legendary Tales? Legendary something. Legendary Adventures? <laughs> Talisman Legendary Tales? That's what I get for not having to be able to Google. There you go. Talisman Legendary something. Um, from Pegasus Wheel. I remember that. That one was neat. Uh, we've only played it twice, so we need to play it some more, but the girls seem to really dig it. Just realize when you're buying the game, it has an I Spy element, which I really wasn't expecting, where you have to find things on the tiles. And with my big table, that doesn't work so well. It's really hard to see from across the thing, and we basically had to end up tearing apart the map and passing around the tiles to be able to look at them. Uh, except for that, it was interesting. There's some really weird stuff, though, because I don't think it's as replayable as they seem to think it is. There's five scenarios, and you don't get, and you pick which difficulty to start at. I think it's one through three. It might be one through four. And you don't get to unlock the next scenario until you have so many stars based on your level. I don't understand why you even have level one, because to unlock st scenario two, you have to have two stars. And you've only unlocked one scenario. So if you play at level one, you then can just play again at level two. Like, it, I honestly don't understand why, like, the minimum wouldn't be the minimum level. Right. And And you also can't jump ahead. So I'm not sure why you would play at level three to start because you only need two stars to unlock the next one. Now, at the end, there is a final score and it's you add up all your stars. So I can kind of see why you might want to do the higher level. But it, it just I found it weird. It like reminded me of like, you know, how you get stars when you're playing apps. And I'm like, but if you only get one star, you don't get to advance. So you have to play again. But there's just not didn't seem to be enough that was randomized that it would be fun to play multiple times. Right. But I've only played it uh, uh, like uh, twice, well, once and a half, one session of it. So it's one I, I still owe them a review on. I need to play more with my girls. But yeah, it's, it's good enough. Uh, to be honest, it's really cheap right now because I don't think it did well. So for the price you can get it for now, I think it's worth it. For full price, I don't. All right. Well, that was Talisman Legendary Tales. And that's it for this month's AMA. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. We are all about answering your questions, and it doesn't have to be during one of our live shows. If you've got a question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 